For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. What about the evidence from carbon, Dr. Sarfati, like uh, with diamonds, for example? Oh, yes. Well, see, this carbon dating is the best known type of radiometric dating. Sorry, but pardon me. The radioactive dating methods you take a an unstable parent uh, isotope which decays over time into daughter isotopes and supposedly from the amount of chemicals in a sample you can tell how long that thing has been decaying for now you have to have a certain assumption like how much do we started with each of these things right. i mean what did we actually start with um zero daughter atoms or were they there in the first place um has the rate been constant well that's actually a reasonably good assumption but there are exceptions to that which i think have been found now uh, good evidence for that but also is the system a closed system or has it been contaminated with some of the stuff from coming from outside so you're destroying it i mean we, we always like to think of a bath a bathtub it, it's uh, got 20 gallons in it and the taps are on and it fills at two gallons per minute so how long did it take for the bath to uh, to get to where it is and you might say well obviously it's 10 minutes divide 20 by two but in fact what if i told you uh, that in fact um someone helpfully poured some boiling water in because it got a bit cold so the source is some stuff from outside and you didn't know the plug was leaking. So some stuff is leaking out of it too. And also the way I fill a bath, I might actually turn every, both taps on uh, full and then I actually slow down the tap rate so it doesn't overflow. You see, so you're assuming that the taps have been the rate, the rate that they're flowing now, but in fact, they've, they've been changed over time. So you've got these certain assumptions that even apply to something as simple as a bathtub. Uh, and yet it applies to the radioactive dating itself. But then let's talk about di carbon dating. See, carbon is one, carbon-14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. You know, carbon is, uh, you've got carbon in your body. It's the most important element for life. Okay, uh, so all of us have carbon. Uh, one in every trillion carbon atoms is carbon-12, which is unstable. And the theory is uh, something dies, it stops exchanging carbon with the environment. So the existing carbon is not replaced and it decays over time. And the half-life is about 5,730 years. And the half-life is the time taken for the stuff to get to half its initial amount. After two half-lives, it's going down to a quarter. After a three half-lives, it's down to one eighth and one sixteenth, one thirty-second, etc. Okay. So the point of doing the calculations, I'm, I'm enough of the chemist to do those calculations. You could calculate that even if the whole Earth was full of carbon fourteen, pure carbon fourteen, it wouldn't even last a million years. Okay, you wouldn't find any detectable carbon fourteen after a million years. So then you go to diamonds, and diamond is a type of carbon. Uh, an allotrope, as we say in chemistry. So it's an allotrope of carbon is the hardest substance on Earth, apart from the human heart anyway. Uh, so the point is, once the, the diamond crystal has been formed, it should be totally free from contamination. It should be about as contamination-free as you can get. So it's a perfect laboratory to test carbon-14 if it's a good dating method. And yet they've tested diamond after diamond and find there's still carbon-14 in those diamonds. And yet the diamonds are meant to be a billion years old or more. Impossible. But if they're over 100,000 years or even over 50,000 years, we shouldn't expect to find any carbon-14 in the diamonds at all. So the fact that we're finding carbon-14 carbon in coal and diamonds shows they haven't existed long enough for the 
carbon-14 to have decayed. So this puts a strict upper limit on the possible age of these things. Not the actual age, but the, it couldn't be any higher than this. It might be lower, but it can't be higher. So carbon-14 is definitely a friend of the biblical creation model and a, and a terrible enemy for the billions of years dogma. Right. That's a really good point, Dr. Sarfati. And I find when you show them the evidence for like carbon and fossils or even in strata that the evolutionists themselves will date to tens of millions of years old, they'll say mm -hmm. contamination. But then you bringing up diamonds, well, diamonds being the hardest substance on Earth, wouldn't its interior then be very resistant to contamination? I mean, well, can I they think use that argument? Diamond isn't resistant, nothing is. Right. Yeah, I mean, you may as well throw the, the method away. If, if it can't work on diamonds, it, 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 I wouldn't trust it on a, on a, on a bone or, or, a, or a parchment, for instance, if it, if it doesn't work on diamonds. Yeah. So you see, um, you can have it both ways. Either you have to say that carbon-14 dating is reliable, or you can have billions of years. You can't have both. You can't right. do both. It, it sounds like they want to have both with, with a lot of um, the evidence and arguments. We've got um, Tony Torpa in the chat who says, what is a good explanation for how radiocarbon C14 originally got inside the diamonds where it was found in rate studies? I would have to assume it was primordial diamond, primordial carbon, because um, it couldn't have got in from outside. So, so presumably primordial carbon when the diamond was formed in the mantle. That's the only thing I can think of. That God created a whole range of isotopes, right. and there's a primordial amount in the initial in not diamonds. Because I'm not sure if diamonds are regarded to have who are, to have formed from organic carbon. So uh, I'd have to say it's primordial um, di carbon that was created there. The fact that we're, however got there is there. Right. The fact that it's there in the first place means it can't be that old. I, I think based on everything you're saying, the fact that, I mean, we find carbon in diamonds, fossils, I believe they've even found it in coal and fossilized wood mm -hmm. in, in places where they say are tens of millions of years old. So hundreds of millions, billions even, yeah. Billions of years. What about, I guess, because uh, Tony here mentioned the rate project, didn't yeah. they also find helium, which is incredibly slippery? They've discovered helium. Okay, and this is Dr. Russell work. See, Dr. John Baumgartner was the one who did the carbon-14 work for, for rate, and he's got some really good material. He answers the objections really well. Dr. Russell Humphreys did another part of the rate um, project, which is to, which to look at helium and zircons. And zircon is a very hard mineral uh, that's quite quite hard to melt. And what, what he found was helium and zircon. Now, the zircon has radioactive L, uh, uranium in it, and uranium is turning into lead. And, and in the process of uranium turning into lead, it loses eight helium, uh, uh, helium atoms from its nucleus. It's called alpha decay. That's, alpha particles are helium nucleus. So it emits an alpha particle. The alpha particle grabs some electrons and becomes helium. So you've got a lot of... Uh, the fact that you have helium there shows that quite a lot of decay has happened. But in fact, if it had happened gradually over millions of years, the helium should have leaked out of the zircon because you can measure how fast helium leaks out. And there's still a lot of helium there. I mean, you think about how long if you have a helium balloon for your kid's birthday party, you know very well that it's going to uh, shrink in a few days because the helium is so slippery, it's, it goes through the rubber of the balloon. You've had that frustration a bit. Right. <laughs> so even, even zircon is, is not uh, hard enough to stop the helium from, from leaking out of it, and that can be measured. And so what uh, Dr. Humphrey says is that this is, shows that we've had um, millions of years of decay, but it must have happened in an accelerated manner. So it's, it's producing this decay really quickly uh, such that the helium hasn't had a chance to escape. So all the decays happen very recently. And so the helium from that decay is still not yet leaked out. And he also did a control experiment with argon, which is like a, it's the same sort of gas, the same sort of um, inert gas as helium, but much um, heavier. So it diffuses more slowly, but he did a control on, on argon diffusion. Again, it, it backed up what he found with the helium. So uh, helium is showing that the decay must have happened only about 6,000 years ago. Otherwise the helium would have gone, which again points to the fact that the decay rate has not been constant. And that undermines right. another major, 
assumption <laughs> behind radioactive dating is the constancy of decay rate, and clearly Dr. Humphrey has shown that it's not constant. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. So that's evidence directly in the rocks then, Dr. Sarfati, that rapid nuclear decay has occurred, right. which gets rid of that assumption, the constant it decay. Does. And the thing is, um, it's quite common in science to discover that it, something has occurred without being able to explain the mechanisms of how that has occurred. I mean, Newton discovered that the law of gravity exists. He didn't uh, offer any um, explanation as to how gravi why gravity works in the first place. He said, I form no hypothesis. He wasn't going to speculate on what causes gravity, only that gravity exists. And I'm... For instance, I'm not sure how nuclear decay rate gets accelerated, only the fact that it has clearly been accelerated. Right. That's a really good point you make, because I've even read uh, in, in the rate research, uh, not only helium, but I, I believe it was Dr. Andrew Snelling who's pointed out the existence of fission tracks and radio, radio halos. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he's pointed out that there has been a lot of decay, but clearly it's happened in a way uh, that's been accelerated. And another thing he's pointed out, for instance, you've got um, different rocks. Um, I mean, the same rock has been dated with different da uh, radioactive dating methods, and they give different dates. Right. But this is consistent if you have some episode of accelerated decay that accelerates the, the long-lived isotopes more than the short-lived isotopes and the alpha more than the beta. Uh, so it seems like there's a pattern there, which seems to fit whatever is causing the accelerated day, uh, decay is working in a pattern that seems to be consistent throughout everything that's been measured. So, it's hard to say that isochron dating makes up for that, though, and that, that's irrefutable. Is well, this... Isochron dating is supposed to take uh, the, the, into account the, um, the initial composition, uh, an initial isotopic composition. But Dr. Snelling years ago, 20 plus years ago, and also Dr. Taz Walker in his honors geology um, project, he could actually find isochron plots with non-radioactive isotopes. So it means that the isochron uh, lines they're finding is not caused, by, they're not caused by radioactive decay over time because he could do it with non-radioactive isotopes. Ah, that's awesome. So it means there's some sort of chemical fractionation process that's going on there, which maybe have nothing to do with radioactive decay because he's getting it in non-radioactive um, isotopes. And since oh. you guys like Lord of the Rings, though, it's, it's a Lord of the Rings connection I can make here too. Yeah. Now, you, you know what Mount Doom is, right? Of course, yeah. Well, you know, the real live mountain in New Zealand is called Ngorohoi. It's a mountain in the middle of the North Island. It's a real live mountain. Yeah, I've seen it personally many times. Okay. Um, you see, what they did is they dated, they got some lava flows they know they knew happened in the 50s. They know the date of a lava flow. And so 50 years later, they did radioactive dating method tests on with this lava flow of known age. And they were getting dates of millions and even billions of years, even though they know the lava, um, the rock was formed only 50 years before. I, I find that to be so funny because why in why in the world then, Doctor Sarfati, would we trust these dating methods if many of them, as you're pointing out here, can't even give accurate dates for rocks of unknown age? But then apparently we're supposed to trust these dating methods for rocks of unknown age. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a sort of real science would say, well, let's see if we can test this on something we know and see if it works. And clearly, it does not work. So therefore to use it for something we don't know. I'd rather trust the eyewitness account of the Bible than these dating methods that, right. that fail in, in places where we can test them. Amen. Amen. Great point. So I find it amazing that based on everything we're talking about here in this portion of the interview, if radioisotope decay was accelerated as indicated by, say, the helium, the fission tracks, the radio halos, the findings of the rate team, and this occurred, say, during the Genesis flood, uh, Dr. Sarfati, mm -hmm. then realistically, these radioisotope decay clocks could never actually be relied upon when they do, say, date, quote-unquote, rocks as, say, millions and billions of years. That's a problem. I think they couldn't be. Right. I I've, I've constantly heard this. This just kind of came to mind because in light of all this evidence for rapid nuclear decay, say, during the flood, they want to just ignore that evidence and then point out that um, you know, the, the flood itself would have generated too much heat and then that heat would have boiled the earth or boiled the oceans. But then 
they're not willing to explain the evidence for um, like rapid accelerated decay. It's clearly occurred, like you said, uh, Dr. That's the thing. I mean, there may be some things which are still uh, not having been fully answered, like the heat problems with, with some flood models. But the point is, uh, when evolutionists are faced with a problem they haven't got a clue about answering, like the origin of first life, they always say, well, let's, let us, um, this is what science is about. It's about solving problems. In that case, the same allowance has to be given to creations. If we have a have a problem that's not yet solved, then yeah, give us a chance to solve them. That's what, what you demand for yourselves. I mean, they don't give up on their materialism when they can't right. possibly explain origin of first life. And yeah, we're supposed to give up creation because uh, we haven't explained everything about the heat model, the heat production <laughs> of, of some of these things. Uh, the double standards are rife there. Exactly. And, and that's what, what came to mind was the double standard based on what we were talking about. Plus, uh, when it comes to the so-called heat problem anyways, when you're thinking about a global flood, and I guess we can move on to that topic, mm -hmm. the, the massive amount of water that was on the earth at the time of the flood would have, I would imagine, taken up a lot of that radiation and heat. I mean, are, it yeah. sounds like they're almost um, making assumptions on the impact of the flood itself with with their arguments well i mean i think they, they're trying to get it they, they they think even the flood might have done it but i think there's still too many unknowns about what could have happened i think there are some even though i think the flood was was largely a natural thing but i think it doesn't mean there weren't any miracles going on during the flood. Right. I mean, we try not to overdo that um because i think there's a lot of natural processes going on but i think something some things are going on it's certainly something god had um, used as a method of judgment so i'm not ruling out um uh, miraculous things i just try not to, to to invoke it if i can help it amen